Um, when you left high school, were you so eager to avoid the whole college scene? Yeah, I was. Uh, I didn't want to go to college. I had decided by the middle of senior year that I didn't want to go to college. And that was because I didn't like where the country was going. I didn't like uh, what I saw around me and society around me. And uh, I didn't like high school. And uh, everything that I had in my personal experience was about freedom. And it was about uh, having fun and uh, having, having an exciting and meaningful life. And I just thought college was suffocating. I mean, you, you have to uh, consider everybody's coming from a different background. And uh, I was born in 1952 in an Irish Catholic family. And uh, I was the second child, and my parents were so glad at how that had turned out that they went on and had eight more children. So uh, <laughs> uh, basically uh, in Chicago, and then we moved to New York after that. By the, you know, by the time I was five, I knew the meaning of betrayal on a very personal level because there was just one baby after another. And I mean, this is what this is what all large families are about. Uh, but at the same time, I knew a very loving family. My parents were very loving. So this this paradox kind of followed me th all the way through to, to age 55. So uh, I knew that everything was about betrayal. And all through the 60s, political leaders were assassinated. The music was full of, uh, you know, it was very inspiring. At, at the same time, it was it was pessimistic and dark. And we had Vietnam on television every day. So, I, you know, I, I knew that uh, the political system was rotten. Whether it is or not, that's what I, that's what I believed, you know. Mm -hmm. um, how did you meet the recruiter that convinced you to enter the war? Well, after I uh, graduated, okay, <clears throat> uh, basically, in May of 1970, we had just gone through the Kent State massacres and the whole spring of radicalism uh, around Cambodia, the invasion of Cambodia. And uh, for example, at my high school graduation at Central High School in Phoenix, Arizona, there was a brawl among the parents in the uh, stands. This was a huge impersonal high school and there had been a completely uh, disparate you know, uh, parents and political beliefs and not a very much consensus. We were passing joints up and down the uh, rows of the students and we were just flipping birds. At the, they had the whole school board up there and the, uh, all of the teachers and the principals that we hated. And we were just uh, being real rebellious because the television cameras were there and the newspapers were there and they couldn't do anything. So the parents were out here fighting and throwing chairs at each other up in the football stand, you know. And we were going through, they were calling out, the valedictorian gave us a radical speech. It would have made Malcolm X proud. And, uh, and everybody was cheering, you know. So basically, when I got my diploma, I jumped over the fence and went out and got my pickup truck, went home and got my belongings and moved out of the house. That was the way it was in those days. And I never basically went back. I had a lot of fun that summer. By October, I had uh, run, out of run out of choices and it wasn't fun anymore. Uh, and so I went, a friend of mine, really an acquaintance, said, why don't you just join the Navy? You won't have to go to Vietnam. You won't have to worry about getting drafted. You'll be real easy. You can get money. You can get training. I said, hey, that sounds like a good idea. And that's all the thought I put into it. I said, okay, let's just do that. Um, what did the recruiter tell you that made you want to enter the Navy? Well, I had already decided that it was a practical thing to do, that I'd go in the Navy. What the recruiter did is he sold me a whole bill of goods that I could uh, sign up for six years and I'd get, tra I'd get really meaningful training. Now, in the summer I had failed in a job where I, what I really wanted to do was be an electronic technician. And uh, I had oversold my, my skills and got into the repair shop at a, a high-end stereo repair s store. And I couldn't fix the stuff. I couldn't fix a television or a stereo, you know, and neither could anyone else. But, um, so I, I saw that, you know, I was uh, vulnerable. And he said, you'll get a great electronic training. All right. Um, tell me about the day when you went to sign up for the Navy. Oh, well, I just got in my car and I drove down to the recruiting office, you know, and. Uh, Looked it up in the yellow pages and went over there and they said, hey, I'm going to sign up for the Navy. And uh, that's pretty much it. I was really an independent uh, kid because of necessity. Uh, you know, my home life was kind of uh, Spartan. 
I lived in Tokyo for 14 years, and my wife and children are Japanese. Oh. Yeah. How many children do you have? I have two. Oh. They're uh, half, half uh, Japanese. I uh, went over there after Reagan was elected. I was just fed up with it. You know, we had a little window of opportunity in the late 70s, and uh, I can't, I can't uh, abide with uh, a country that goes around killing people. Right. And uh, so I left. And I came back in 96, you know, after uh, when Clinton was around the country. And uh, I ha uh, since Bush got elected, I haven't been a happy camper. So after you went into the Navy, did they send you straight to schooling? Well, you know, they, they put me on hold for a few weeks. I can't remember exactly what the... But then, you know, they give you a call and they say, come to the bus station at, uh, you know, on November 30th. And so I came down to the bus station. Uh, or maybe it was Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix. I can't remember. I'm just, I'm just Sky Harbor Airport. Uh, okay, so I show up there. And uh, it was kind of a, you know, there's a couple other people show up. And uh, this guy just start sh so start showing, showed up and started bossing us around, just talking to us like, all right, you maggots, get over here. Do this, do that, you know, and just shut up. No talking aloud here. And it's, what the heck is this, you know? I, I joined the Navy so I can be a sonar tech or electronic technician and uh, get training and, uh, you know, defend my country. And why do I have to, you know, this is kind of unexpected. So that's how it went. We got on the plane, got over to San Diego, and got even worse in San Diego, which we can go into that later. Um, so, so you were leaving all your family and everyone. Was that hard at all? No. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, I had already had two successful business careers. I was a newspaper boy tycoon, and I had made pretty good money from, like, 13 to 16, and bought a car and traveled and stuff. And then from 16 to 18, I had worked in restaurants, and I was uh, real good at it. And I had plenty of money, and I had lived independently from my, my family, you know, traveled around the Southwest and uh, did a lot of camping, motorcycling. So I didn't miss my, my family, no. Okay. Um, so then you went down to San Diego and you took basic and electronic schooling? Well, boot camp. They always send you to boot camp first. Okay. And uh, basically that was just a big uh, humiliation uh, thing, which, uh, you know, it was fun on a certain level because for the first time in my life, I got to have, uh, you know, a close contact with uh, a group of guys doing something that was you know, uh, we, did, we were doing it together, we were having a common experience, and we were bonding with each other and all this stuff. You know, you're thrown together in, the, in these difficult times, and you're in a, sleeping together and close together. And so, uh, um, so then, what was the schooling like for you? How long were you in school? Oh, the school? After I got out of boot camp, then uh, I was in basic electric, beep school, basic electricity and electronics pre-training pre or something. I don't know. And that was, it was laughable. I mean, uh, I had taken electronics in high school for one term. And we learned, you know, I mean, what they were teaching us in that class was here's a battery, here's the plus and minus, here's a light bulb, you know. And if you wind wire around a, a nail, you can make a magnet. That's the kind of, literally, you know, that's how stupid that was. And uh, I was a ham radio operator when I was 12. I was a general class ham radio operator. And I knew already all I need to know about basic electricity. So I didn't learn anything there. It was just like, you know, why can't I just take the final and leave, you know? And then uh, I entered um, basic uh, sonar school. Okay, that was also in San Diego. And that was little more than a kind of like a walkthrough on different pieces of sonar equipment. And it became very clear that really what my, uh, my job was going to be a sonar operator, not a sonar technician. Everything in the sonar equipment already in those days was black boxes, and today it's even more so. Nobody repairs sonar equipment or anything electronic in the U.S. military. Everything is in a black box, and it has a serial number on it, and a pull date, and you know, and you just when it doesn't work, you throw it away and stick another one in there. And you know, if you don't have, that's what logistics is all about and supply chain. You know, you've got a, all the spare parts, and everybody knows exactly where they are, just like Walmart. You know, it's no different. So anyway, I'm learning how to operate, you know, very little hands-on, actually. We're standing around in groups, and they're showing us the ping analyzer that, uh, you know, if you send out a ping, boop, and then it comes back, boop, that means that the other ship is moving away, right? Because there's a Doppler shift. I mean, this is like, you know, right, I joined for six years to learn this. 
and you know, and then you push a button and it says the difference between your two speeds is you know 17.2 knots. Right, great. Okay. Next machine. That's sort of what they were teaching us, you know. So, did you enjoy the schooling, or was it just? It was a it was a lark. There was nothing you know to it. There was nothing to enjoy or not to enjoy. You just stand around and eat your uh, ice cream sandwich and you know drink your coffee and. The, uh, you know, the other, the guys, the Navy guys, they were just porky guys who were just, you know, like a first class from, who had been out to sea for eight years and now they were on, they had shore duty. And so they were showing us how to work the equipment. Okay. You know, it was just, there was no intellectual or, or technical content. Right. You know, the intellectual content and technical content is in the uh, supplier. In their, in their engineering departments, Raytheon or whoever it may have been who built that stuff, General Dynamics or whoever. Alright. Um, once you left basic and electronic schooling, you were switched to that submarine operator job. Um, how did you find out that you were being forced to change your position? In boot camp, uh, about the midway or two-thirds of the way through, they uh, tell you one by one. They they say, "Okay, we got all you guys' papers here. Where you're going to be assigned, or what your training is going to be, where you're going next." And uh, so then they would just break us out and start telling us, you know, one by one. And they said, "Sorry, Mr. Boyle, the, uh, there's no uh, electronics tr uh, technician slots available. We don't need you for that." And so you you have uh, two choices. You can either be a sonar technician, which is the same thing. You get just as much electronic training. I mean, this is really first class electronic training. This is you're, you're not going to be disappointed. You know, you can't go wrong. Um, or you can do I don't know some other thing. And so I just checked the box. You know, I was not really paying much attention because I knew that they were betraying me, and the whole thing was a laughable. You know, I didn't even imagine that they would uh, honor their contract. I wasn't surprised when they told me I couldn't be an electronic technician, and I wasn't surprised when I found out the training was a joke. And all along, I planned on leaving the Navy if I didn't like it. And you know, every place I look, there's uh, people violating their contracts. I mean, why would this be any different? You know, I mean, this stuff about honor and duty and all that stuff, none of us in boot camp even paid any attention to that. We were like, yeah, I'm going to salute the flag. Oh, yeah, yeah. And when, when are we out anyway, you know? It's like, that was the, uh, it was not a patriotic feeling at that time. How did you feel about changing from the position that you had been promised? Well, I was... Uh, I was, uh, it reinforced my decision to get out of the Navy, which I had made after about the third day. What made me uh, uh, first decide to get out of the Navy was the uh, abuse. I, the abuse that I saw them uh, in, in inflicting on other guys more than me. And I said, this is, you know, I'm out of here. Um, once you had transferred positions, you were moved from San Diego out to New London, CT. Um, can you tell me about the move between those two places? Okay, so if I, I joined in November, I got out of basic training at the end of February, and then I did these electric, electricity things, you know, how to turn on a switch, and how to operate the ping thing. And uh, about uh, midsummer, I guess, I uh, got assignment to the uh, submarine school, which was uh, I knew that when I signed up for sonar technician that they were talking about submarine school. So I said, okay. So you know. Uh, I had a few days leave, I guess, maybe a weekend or something, and then I got on a plane and flew to uh, New York and transferred to New London to Groton, and uh, took a bus over to the to the base and you know signed in and got you know they give you a place to sleep, and, like four to a room I think. Um, how did you adjust to being in New London? Um, was it uh, hard to have a social life outside the military service? Oh, it was impossible for me. Uh, I wasn't that adept socially anyway. I mean, I was an alienated kid in high school. You know, I'll just put that right out there. The, my uh, uh, greatest pinnacle of um, social success that I ever achieved was driving up and down Main Street, you know, which is called Central Avenue, cruising the, the strip, you know. And, you know, at least I knew a few people that I could wave to and I could pull up next to and just talk a little bit. But I never went to any dances. I was, didn't go to any football games. I had no friends in high school. Basically, I couldn't remember the names of three people that I went to high school with. And so now you plunk me in the middle of Groton, Connecticut, which is a real convoluted place with a bunch of uh, 
you know, lifer military people and uh, a corrupt Republicanish, uh, you know, population of everything from, you know, there was no no social life for me, either off base or on base. And to make matters worse, I got sick. I had a raging, uh, you know, strep throat and, and fevers for about two months. So I didn't have a good time there. Uh, okay, so we're going to go ahead and flash back to boot camp. Uh, what boot camp did you end up going to? NTC, Naval Training Center, San Diego. Uh, can you tell me about uh, like your first day at boot camp? Yeah, we were arriving uh, in groups of larger than five by that time because we were, you know, people were coming from around the country <coughs> to start boot camp. Uh, so those of us who came from Phoenix were pretty much just put in the line there and more people came in line. And uh, I don't know how much, you know, we stood around. I can't really remember what the first day was like, but it was basically stand up straight. Hey, shut up. No talking. Just shut up. Hey, get rid of that bag. Who told you you could bring that much stuff? You know, it was just like, just kind of stuff all day long. It was like, what, what's this all about, you know? Uh, but very, very soon after we arrived, um, we were uh, taken in and got our, our hair shaved off and all of our civilian clothes into a bag or something into a, off into storage. And we were, uh, took showers and started to take, getting a lot of shots. I mean, we must have gotten 60 shots, you know? It was just like both asses and both uh, shoulders, you know, once a week, that type of thing. So, um, by the, by the end of, you know, the first 12 hours, you're pretty much, uh, you've been de-insecticided and de-lysed and, sh and shaved and, uh, you know, uh, given a whole bunch of antibiotics and, you know, and then you're just standing out on the parking lot for, for four hours waiting to do what to do next. We spent more time just standing out on the parking lot, which they call the drill field, than anything else all put together. Either standing or standing at ease standing at parade rest, marching, what they call marching, but, you know, basically just pretty much hanging out, so doing push-ups, getting abused, getting insulted and abused by uh, people you don't know, not even your company commander. People will come in and just say, you guys are really looking slouchy out here. Look at this guy over here. And they just start, they start beating on somebody, you know, and everybody get down here and give us 50 push-ups, you know, and everybody goes, oh, no, not more push-ups, you know. It was ridiculous. I think, you know, what they, what they were really trying to do was a psychological thing to make everybody obedient. And plus, it was making our, our bodies stronger to be standing up, to be outdoors, and to be in a push-up position a lot of the time. And by the time you got out of boot camp, you're like, yeah, man. And you go back home, you go, you know, you look all muscle-bound and everything. And a month later, you're back to normal, you know. Like, everybody got a ring, you know. They would go off base and buy a ring to go with their, they join the Navy and they get their finger sized up, and then two months later the ring has fallen off because it's too big, you know? And because they never did any more exercise again after they joined the Navy. <laughs> so then was boot camp like people said it was going to be, or was it what you expected? Yeah, it was pretty much what I expected. I, I, it's physically, physically was what I expected. I expected to be, you know, doing more, uh, I, I really expected to be doing more physical training. And we didn't really do physical training. What we did was just bogus, you know, marching up and down all day and maybe a run once in a while was the extent of it. I mean, we had one day when we went to the rifle range and basically it was a shooting test. It wasn't even shooting practice. It's, you know, they showed us what it looks like when you shoot an M16 and they pick up this gun and shoot that and they say, okay, and this is what a 50 cal looks like. And, and, then they, and then they watch us all off in there and make us shoot the gun and then you go back to base and you never see another gun. Except you carried around these toy guns, you know. They were uh, like 1916 Springfields or something. You have to carry it around, you know. I'm in the Navy and I'm carrying around a 1916 carbine that doesn't shoot, you know. Um, so then what was just a, a typical day like from when you woke up to when you went to bed? 5 a.m. The lights come on and some, uh, you know, first class or somebody comes in and yells at us, everybody, everybody get out of bed, get up, get up, get up, you know, so everybody gets up and it's running around, you know, and take, some people are shaving and I didn't have to shave. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have to totally f make your bed. So you spend about a half an hour making your bed and everything has to be so perfect within a quarter of an inch, you know, how you fold everything up and all your socks has to be pointed a certain way and folded in half. 
and it's just really fetishistic. So this was about uh, attention to detail. It was military training. And we knew it. You know. So you stand at attention, and everybody's standing at attention next to their bed, you know, and the inspector comes around and he says, this is dirty. All right, all you guys in this row, get down and give me 50 push-ups. Oh, shut up. Everybody gets down and they start doing push-ups, you know. And uh, look at this over here on the floor, you know. Give me another 50 push-ups. It was ridiculous. You know, so what they're trying to do is to get peer pressure going so that everybody would mop the floor more perfectly. So they'd be more disciplined. So what was the rest of your day like? Well, every day was different. You know, there was, uh, what, almost three months. And uh, I can't remember very much of any uh, training or, you know, classroom type of thing. I can remember a lot of time spent where the, uh, there was a chief, you know, uh, an E7 or maybe an E8, chief petty officer. He was a great guy. And he was our commander and he would, he would read us information, tell us stuff. So we, we had some of that going on. Uh, but mostly it was like out on the drill field. Well, you know, you go to breakfast, you know, and waste time and everything. So it's maybe 7.30 or something, you're out on the drill field. And then you're just standing around until 9.30 and trying to, you know, wait f until they tell you what you're going to do today. And then you start tramping down and, and you go and get another round of shots maybe. And then this takes like three hours because there's, you know, 800 people there and they're just doing them real slow and it's all, you know, hurry up and wait. So you get a lot of practice at standing, and then you can, you can do parade rest, and then you can stand at attention, and then you can turn, and you can march up here and down back, and then you wait some more. Typical, you know. There was nothing going on, I'm telling you. It was, it was just BS the whole three months. The only thing that you, you're being trained is they're trying to find out who's going to be a troublemaker. They're trying to find out who's going to have a breakdown or get lonely or something, or you know. They're just trying to find out who's just going to be a reasonably reliable guy and they're going to put you on a ship, and then they want you to do what you're told. And they want to make sure that you're capable of doing what you're told. To do that, they make you fold up your socks every day the exactly the same way. I mean, you could be, um, literally, you could be a robot. You could build a robot that could go through boot camp, and it would, be a, it would pass those sorts of tests. I don't know if it's still like that, but that's how it was in those days. Um, okay, so what was like the worst day at boot camp like? There wasn't really a bad day for me because I didn't, uh, I didn't talk back or uh, make any resistance. But there were guys who did, and they got beat up, you know, and pretty much run out of the room. There, there was an immediate uh, reaction if somebody uh, started to be a discipline case that at least there would always be at least two, uh, you know, commanders there. Our, our chief, let's say, and then some, some beefy guy from the Marines or something. I don't know where these guys came from. And so they would just take these guys and it only happened two times. Uh, and they had a bad day. But there was, there was no bad days in Navy boot camp. It was just like, you know, you do, do your push-ups and, you know. When, when you say that they got beat up, what do you mean by that? When uh, two guys come up and grab you, and then run you down to the end of the room and throw you against a, a swinging door, about as heavy as that door. And then such that you now fall out the other end of the door. And then they go out and throw you down the stairs. To me, that's beating up. Yeah, okay. Wow. So was there any like good part about boot camp? Anything that you liked about it? Um, Probably, to be, to be perfectly honest, it was, it was kind of nice to be in a group, to be a member of a team, to be a member of a tribe. And I think that's the most natural human urge. And um, it was, I got to know a lot of guys pretty closely. We talked about our, our families, we talked about the meaning of life. You know, we had plenty of time to sit around and talk, and especially in the evening. We had nothing else to do, and we're in a very confined area. You can't just walk off around the base. You know, you're, you stay in your barracks, or that's it. You know. So everybody played, you know, ch played cards or whatever. I don't know what we did. Uh, talked a lot, smoked a lot of cigarettes. So that was that was the social part. Was uh, 
it, it filled a need for, that I had that I had never, I had never uh, satisfied until then. And uh, other than that, there was no, there was no uh, scope for achieving anything, you know. So I knew that I was wasting my time, you know, it's because I'm not getting any training and time's going by and, you know. Also, I was kind of glad that I had, what is it, $300 a month coming in or whatever it was. I was glad. I was glad that I had a few hundred dollars Then I was looking forward to getting out of boot camp because I had got a signing bonus and I could buy a car. And to me, I was, this is, I was really going to get my rocks off because I had been driving around this 1960 Ford pickup truck and I wanted to have a real car like the other guys on Central Avenue, you know. I mean, that's what I was thinking. Okay, and this might be slightly repetitive, but what was the worst part about the boot camp? Well, um, the worst part of it was knowing, you know, it, it sunk in during the during boot camp what the military was doing in, in, in Vietnam, and, and which was killing millions of people. And uh, really, it sort of sunk in that this isn't something that that was. Uh, an ethical, this is an immoral thing to be involved with. And so that was, uh, I, I, was I was growing more conscious of that, that, it, that I wasn't going to be able to do this uh, for that reason. You know what, actually I'll tell you what, I was uh, beginning to manifest a kind of personality of, rebellious, of rebellion. So now I was going to test myself against the Navy instead of testing myself against the enemy or against, you know, the military, uh, you know. I wasn't going to test my manhood by being a, a, a great sailor. I was going to prove that I was a man by being, being smart enough to get out of the Navy. That was sort of what I did. Um, were you ever in combat in that year and a half of service? No. <coughs> When you were a sonar operator, were you ever on a ship or submarine? And what was your impression of that ship? I was on the USS Petrel down in South Carolina for a couple of months. We don't, went out to sea once. And uh, that was pretty interesting. You know, I had never been on a ship. And, uh, you know, uh, my CEO was a great guy. He was, uh, and so was, you know, I liked, it. I liked all the folks there. I wasn't able to make any any connection with them, you know, they didn't want to talk to me. I don't know who they, you know, the people on the ship had a, had a life, you know. They had their families and so on, so they wouldn't, particularly the older people, would leave, you know. And so there were a few younger people on the ship. This ship wasn't full of young people. It had a whole range of people and relatively few newcomers like myself. So um, it was a, uh, it was another uh, isolating and uh, you know, lonely experience. But the, the ship itself was interesting, and the sonar was kind of fun. I was, a, I was a good sonar operator. I took it apart and did maintenance on it and stuff, and it was kind of fun. Right. Um, was there ever a time that you were happy or proud that you joined the Navy? Only when I had my uh, car. I was happy that I got money. I was never, you know, I was never proud, you know, of my picture in uniform or anything like that. In fact, my friends and, and my family teased me. Why? You know, uh, it's, it's kind of bogus to be joining a military, uh, you know, when it's something you don't believe in and it's, a, it's something that's uh, pretty uh, serious. You know, you're good, making a contract to go and kill people, and you're uh, giving up your freedom of choice and subordinating your will to another person. To me, that's that's a that's not an honorable thing to do. It's not a noble thing to do. Uh, and then, furthermore, to be pretending, and all the people around you are also basically pretending, you know, uh, to to uh, give up their you know give up their freedom of choice and rather organize themselves into hierarchies, depending on what rank you are. Uh, the whole thing is a, it's a, a medieval construct, really. And uh, we just thought it was bogus. You know, a human being is, is higher than a role anyways, even if, it was, even if you were a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. 
but a human being is certainly higher than a role of a, of a, of a, of a killer, a trained killer, who doesn't, even have, who doesn't even participate in the choice of when or who or how to kill people. That's not something that, I, that our culture, our, you know, our Catholic uh, high school that I went to or anything, you know, that they honored. Tell me about the time when you realized the Navy wasn't really your place to be. Oh yeah, that was in the uh, early days of boot camp when I saw this hazing going on. Well, I mean, I, I didn't really expect the Navy to be my place to be. You know, uh, this is why they ha this is why they enlist people when they're 18, is because normally they haven't had they haven't lived independently, which I had lived independently already, and I, I knew that I could. I didn't need the Navy, you know. The Navy was a, was a means to an end for me. And I was not a, I was not a good kid, really. I, was, I did some shoplifting uh, at that time in my life that I'm not proud of. I stole from my employer, like a, I worked in a restaurant, I stole a case of beer now and then. You know, I didn't, uh, I wasn't a good employee. I just missed work, you know. Uh, I didn't honor my, uh, my uh, commitments. I was just a careless, you know, young 18-year-old uh, kid. Um, was it just one event that made you despise the Navy, or were there many events that piled up? No, you know, once I decided I wanted to get out, then it started to become kind of a fixation for me. Because it, as the days would go by, and there's, the base is a, basically a desert. There's nothing interesting. And the people, as soon as you get out of that compression of, of boot camp, then the other military guys, they, it expands like, and they go back out into their pattern of being isolated, okay? and which I did too. Now all of a sudden you can't get a conversation going. You know, what happened to this, this feeling of being a member of, a, of something? It went away, you know? Maybe, it, maybe it, they still keep it if, if you're in combat or something. Maybe I would have had it if I would have stayed on the ship. But I didn't have it anywhere through the training periods. So during those weeks, I started to try to get out. And I said, oh, you know, I'm sick, you know. And I tried, I told them I was gay at one point. Uh, I tried to uh, be a conscientious objector. And then they laughed at me and said, get out of here. We're not doing conscientious objector here. We don't do conscientious objector. You couldn't apply. And I believed them. Probably you could. But I believed them. So, you know, you asked me, how did, it, how did I get firmer in my resolve? It was just a process, once I had decided to get out, you know, then I, it, it, became my, it became my personality. My personality was how to get out. And then one day, there was a, uh, there was a directive from El Admiral Zumwalt called ZGRAM 94. And this ZGRAM 94 appeared on the bulletin board in submarine school in Connecticut. And it said that anybody who has been uh, using drugs we want you to come down and sign in uh, and, and fill out the form and tell us what and how much you're using. And then we're either going to uh, give you a rehab or we're going to give you discharge. Discharge! And I was the first guy down, the, well, I was the second guy in the base to fill in that thing. By the time uh, I got off that base, there was hundreds of guys. There was two whole barracks of two floors full of guys who had signed up for ZGRAM 94. And that was, uh, and almost all of them got out as far as I know. You know, at that time, they had just lost two nuclear submarines in the Atlantic because of uh, mechanical failures. And uh, people were pouring ball bearings into the drivetrains of, the, of the, the gear boxes of ships and things. I don't know if you've ever heard this. But in the Navy, the way resistance to the military evolved during the late 60s and the early 70s was sabotaging the equipment. Because if somebody sabotaged the equipment, then the, the ship wouldn't go, or the airplane wouldn't fly. Well, a lot of them fell out of the sky, and they never knew why. And so what they, there were so many people who wanted out of the Navy. I mean, even, even the officers, they were completely sympathetic. You know, when I was trying to get out of the Navy, I never got any uh, personal vitriol or any uh, criticism from the, from the uh, enlisted, senior enlisted or officers for trying to get out. They said, oh, we don't blame you, you know. They didn't say that, but... It's another Yosarian. Oh, yeah. Lots of luck, kid. When are you leaving for New London? 
That's how it was. And then you get to New London, you want to get out. Actually, there were a few, you know, uh, real dedicated, you know, patriots and stuff there. I started running into some there. But uh, most of them understood. When I, in fact, when I, they, they didn't let me out. They sent me down to, down to uh, South Carolina. And the, uh, I went up to the um, commanding officer and I said, you know, I've really got the shakes and uh, I need more drugs, you know, and I'm, I'm using more drugs than ever. And uh, he said, uh, son, you want out of the Navy, don't you? I said, well, yeah, but I, I, I really do have a drug problem, you know, because if you didn't have a drug problem, there was no way they were going to let you out. And uh, quite frankly, I was saying, I was claiming to be using a lot of drugs that I wasn't even using. Uh, I mean, it's like check the box. LSD, amphetamines, barbiturate. What's a barbiturate? You know, check the boxes down here and uh, got out, you know. So he said, get off my ship. Get over there. Get out of the floor, sailor. Get out of here. You're going to be in a captain's mess next week, you know. And so he didn't want me around his, his ship, you know. Because actually, I, uh, I did convince one other guy to get to do the same thing I did, and uh, we did get out. But meanwhile, uh, you know, he got us out of the ship and away over onto the base as quickly as he could. And then uh, about a month later, the orders came and we we got our discharges. <laughs> okay, so although you were discontent with the Navy, what did you think about the rest of the military? I really didn't know what was going on. I, I, I knew what was going on in Vietnam. And uh, as much as we all did from the news, and I didn't like that at all. And the more I saw, the less I liked it. You know, My Lai Massacre and all this business, you know. It was, it was getting worse all the time, really. And, you know, the, the people in the military knew that that country never attacked the U.S., and they weren't even a threat to the U.S. And, you know, the Pentagon Papers came out you know, the history from, from Ellsberg, you know, about the, all the uh, lies that had gone into building the war. And it was, it was basically, it was for the military industrial complex and some, some domestic political interests, you know. Uh, and here we are killing all these people, and they're never going to give up. You'd have to kill all of the Vietnamese to the last man, because they were not going to give up. What's the point? You know, we destroyed the country, dumped uh, dioxin all over the country, uh, Anyway. So at that time, were you doing anything against the wars? Not while I was in the Navy. I did some in high school, you know, black armband type of thing. I didn't, I wasn't a big leader. Okay, did you ever think that you would have rather been in a different branch of the military? Or was the military just not your place? I certainly didn't want to be in any, any branch of the military after the first few days. And then what was the first thing you did once you actually got your discharge? They give you a, t a plane ticket back to your c city of origin and, I don't know, 50 bucks or something. So basically I flew back to Phoenix and uh, went back to my parents' house. Um, and uh, I just pretty much whooped it up and had a good time for a while. Uh, I didn't want to live at home. What did I do? I guess after, within a, within a few months, maybe within two months, I think I moved out and got an apartment. Went back to work in the restaurant. Back to my same old thing. And I started uh, college on the GI Bill. That was pretty cool. But, you know, I wasn't really very successful because uh, during this, uh, this period, I had actually started smoking pot. And I'm one of these people who can't smoke pot. I don't know if this is maybe a well-kept secret, but some people can smoke pot and some people can't. And I was one of the people who can't. And, uh, you know, I, could st I was still coordinated. I could still ride my motorcycle or anything like that. But I, I had no judgment, no memory, no context. And uh, so I was not making wise choices with my life. I didn't, I didn't you know, I was, uh, I was more successful when I got out of high school before I went in the Navy because I had a great uh, sex life, which I had never had in high school. I was a virgin until I moved out on my own. Uh, I had uh, a much better friends than I did in high school. And really, I shouldn't have gone in the Navy. It was, it was a goofy thing to do. 
you know, I was depressed because I was not successful in this electronic job. And I was fed up with being a waiter or busboy. And I couldn't lift myself up enough to look at other opportunities. I could have got involved in a union. You know, I could have gotten some kind of apprenticeship program or I could have gone to junior college. I didn't even know that I had any op options, you know, that I'd be interested in. I just had this narrow concept of what college would be like and I had this narrow concept of what the Navy would be like and I had this very uh, full experience of working in restaurants and I had a belly full of that because I didn't even have enough money to pay my rent, you know. And so based on my limited little decision, I went in the Navy. Big mistake. Um, when you first got back, uh, what was it like to see your family after not being with them for a year and a half? More? Well, I had been, uh, when I was in San Diego, I drove back and forth pretty often. I used to uh, try to go as fast as I could, and I think I made it in four and a half hours one time from San Diego to Phoenix. That, was, that Mustang was really great. It was really a fast car, and I, I was quite an insane driver. Um, but, you know, my, my mom and dad, you know, we didn't really spend a lot of time talking, you know. They were alcoholics. Uh, they had nine other kids to take care of. Um, I, I, I just can't, honestly can't remember having very many conversations with them after uh, I got out of high school. They wanted us out of the house, you know. They, 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 were, they were up to here with it, you know. It was too much work. Um, after you left the military, you were against the war, right? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I did more protesting then. Yeah, so what was your first course of action against the war? Well, I just noticed on the, uh, at Phoenix College they had some uh, notices on the board, you know, if there's going to be a demonstration, and I'd just go turn out for it. That's, that's all. I didn't do much. Well, I, I was, as I say, I was very selfish, very, uh, you know, narcissistic and inward-focused. Uh, Plus, I was smoking pot at that time, which my junior college, uh, that part of my uh, transcript is a disaster area of C's and, and dropped courses and stuff. I couldn't do the work. I was just screwed up on, on pot. Okay. All right. And, well, after you left the military, where did you eventually find work? Oh, I didn't have to work, you know. I'm a very thrifty guy. I should mention this. Um, I haven't worked very much in my life. Uh, basically, my strategy in life is to save money and not spend money. And by not having to spend money, then I don't have to go make money. And after I got out of the Navy, I, uh, I sucked up the GI Bill to pay my expenses, my rent. And at that time, there was lots of uh, financial aid for college. And so I would get several kinds of financial aid. And basically, by the time I got my degree, I had saved up thousands of dollars and I didn't have to work at all. So I still didn't, I still didn't work. And uh, I was living in a truck a lot of that time because I didn't want to pay rent. All right. Um, when did you become part of Veterans for Peace? 2003, yeah. When uh, this current war came over the horizon, I was down at a protest in, uh, in Seattle at Westlake Plaza. And uh, there were some Veterans for Peace over there. And I went over and I said, oh, how are you doing? You know, and this guy said, you should join Veterans for Peace. And I said, I don't uh, relate to myself as being a veteran, you know. And, he, and they all looked at me and said, good, you're the guys we're looking for, you know. And they wanted me to join the Veterans for Peace because uh, half of the people in the Vets for Peace are, uh, you know, conscientious objectors and so on. And uh, it was kind of nice, you know. I mean, for the first time in my life, I got some recognition that what I did getting out of the Navy might have been right. I mean, not that I was going around asking for, for approval, you know, at age 50, but uh, I hadn't uh, talked about it much in my life. I'm sure there are people who will see this clip, you know, or read my words, and they'll think that I'm despicable because I got out early and I didn't defend my country. Well, I certainly don't, and nobody in the, nobody in the Vets for Peace did. So it was kind of nice to have some, uh, some people who uh, thought like me. It was a good tribe to join. Mm. All right, um, we read that you quit software and financial managing a position in 2003 to become a full member, you know? Um, that's true, right? 
Yeah, I, uh, I burned my CPA license and quit working for money. I right. spent all my, my, my life savings. And uh, a country that has to kill millions of people for oil doesn't deserve its money. And we're all part of it. You're either part of it or you're not. And so I'm not. And what convinced you to quit and do all that? This war. This is this savage attack on, uh, on Iraq. It was, you know, as if it wasn't enough what the sanctions did and what the, uh, it basically, it just brought back a whole flood of feelings about Vietnam. To me, this is just a, a repeat of Vietnam. Okay, but now I'm not a powerless 18-year-old kid. Now I'm 50, and I don't have to pay my rent. I bought my house and paid for it with cash. I saved up my money and I bought my house. I don't have a mortgage, I don't have, and I don't care about it. I'll lose my house. I'd be very happy to go live in a truck because, you know, I just don't need that stuff. I don't need it. What I need is, is, is a peace of mind and a sense that I belong to an ethical and, and a good society and I want to have a feeling that my society is doing something good that's going places. That we're going to go to the moon, you know, like when I was in, in, in the 1960s. We were going to put a, put a man on the moon, you know, this type of thing. And I don't, this, the future that Bush has in mind, I don't want that, I don't want that to happen. And if it happens, I don't want to be part of it. So I'm opposed to the, uh, to the government now, you see. I've been opposed all my life. When I was a CPA for 20 years, I was opposed to all the cheating, lying people I ran into, cheating on their everything. Everybody wants to cheat on their taxes, they're cheating their partner, cheating their spouses, lying to their employees, employees stealing from their bosses. Everybody's, everybody's screwing everybody. I'm, I'm serious, you know. If you want to do a, a report, you should, you should talk to CPAs if they've ever had any clients. How many of their clients cheat somebody? And you're going to find out that three-fourths of them are, that the reason why they're in the CPA's office is to help them cheat somebody or protect against somebody who's cheating them. So uh, I, I rebelled against that. I was a complete failure at Ernst & Young, Price Waterhouse. I wasn't the type of guy that they were looking for, you know. So I did my five years and I quit. I went to work for another company, you know. Maybe I'm telling you more than you need to know. No, this is good. Um, what is your role as part of Veterans for Peace now? Well, you know, I just, uh, I went to the meetings for the last five years, four, four and a half years, whatever it is. And I've tried and tried to get the Veterans for Peace to stand up and, and be politically active other than just standing like dummies out on a, in, the, in the street. And I think where we need to be is engaged in the legislature and the city council, school boards, commissions of all kinds, uh, and every place where there's a, a microphone. I want the Vets for Peace in my chapter to grow up and learn how to express their, their thoughts and their beliefs in a coherent political policy, and then go down there and argue with those right-wingers. And we're going to put a stop to war and preparations for war. They won't do it. They would rather just kind of sit around and socialize for two hours every month, and then they all go their own separate ways. And some of them do a lot of good activism individually, you know, but they don't do it as a, as a VIP chapter. And none of them give speeches at the, at the school board, city council, any commissions, you know, uh, county. They don't, they don't do that. They don't speak. They don't know how to speak. They, they're, it's not a rational type of, it's the culture of that VFP chapter is not a rational culture. In fact, it's recovering militarists, really. You know, if you're going to look for real peace people, you're not going to find them amongst the population who have gone through, who have been in the military. You're going to find some, but, you know, 90% of the ex-military are pro-war. And so you have this little uh, exceptional group called Veterans for Peace. And somehow, we try to uh, take advantage of the fact that we're veterans because that gives us more credibility. But in doing so, we ratify this idea that veterans get credibility. They should have more credibility because they were in wars. Actually, the opposite is true. Those are the least likely people to have a balanced view of what war is about. The people who understand what war is about are people who didn't join the military. And then they've gone from strength to strength after they were 18 and they develop much better intellect 
you know. So college professors, you know, might be a population. Uh, people in the peace churches, you find real anti-war people. And the people in the Vets for Peace, nationally, not all of them, but most of them are traditionals. They believe in having a strong military. They believe that there's a need for having a strong military. If you ask them in their hearts of hearts, do they want to cut the military budget? They all say yes, but then if you get right down to cutting it by three-fourths so that it would only defend the United States, most of them don't want to do that. Most of them believe that the people, you know, I'll tell you what, almost all Veterans for Peace believes that military service is an honorable thing and that those people don't know it's not their fault that they're killing people. That's what they believe. And so they believe that veterans are entitled to privileges, that they should have good health care, they should, that we should su support the Veterans Administration funding, all this sorts of thing. Because they, in their hearts of hearts, they identified it being a veteran, and they think that they earned something by going and killing people or whatever they did, and that the country owes them something because they did something for their country. Hey, when you started to unpack that, people shout at me and yell at me. They don't think the same way. They don't. Truth is that they think that the military is, is an honorable profession. And they're, they're only against the war in Iraq. And God, I don't even know why they are. I think they're opposed to the war in Iraq because it was unsuccessful. And now it's, it's just time to wrap it up and rebuild our strength for the next, next war. OK, um, so when we talk about your participation in Veterans for Peace, is there any one event that really sticks out in your mind? The uh, 2006 National Convention. I mean, we were really uh, a great bunch. You know, we, we, got the, uh, we got the Vets for Peace National Office to, or the Board of Directors to locate the, the convention in Seattle. And we had to make a proposal and everything and convince them. And then I think we did a super job. I think we probably put together one of the best conventions that they've ever had. Uh, we had just like 50 good speakers and um, lots of activities for people to get involved in. Plus, uh, there were spectacular um, and unplanned things like Aaron Watata showed up and gave us a terrific speech, you know, uh, again, why he's uh, refusing to go to Iraq, you know, this Lieutenant Watata. Um, Cindy Sheehan showed up, you know, there was just, it was a, it was a interesting, interesting uh, convention. So, uh, and that's, that was the Vets for Peace Seattle chapter that put that together. So I was pretty proud of that. Although, uh, you know, Veterans of Peace has associate members who are not veterans. And so some of the people who helped with that convention were not veterans. They were uh, very highly evolved, you know, experienced peace people, like Jerry Haynes, uh, Erica Kay, whatever her name is. And, uh, you know, uh, lots of volunteers who weren't veterans. But the, uh, the VFP chapter uh, is really the ones who, who did it, who pulled it off, who did a lot of the work. We videotaped it. You can have a, a set of videos if you want. Sure. Well, be great. What was the, the main goal of the convention? The uh, theme of the convention was uh, so, so justice reap peace. And so where the, where the Vets for Peace, you know, nationally is, is trying, to, trying to get to is how do we put a stop to war. And uh, the prevailing theory, okay, uh, that people are working with is if we have more uh, social and economic justice in the United States, such as, uh, you know, Katrina or whatever, then we won't have, we won't be planting the seeds of future wars. And furthermore, if we... Uh, try to achieve justice in, in foreign countries like pa uh, Palestine, for example, then we won't have wars. And so if you want to stop wars, you can't just protest wars when they start to happen. You have to create uh, justice. You have to address the injustices. So that was the theme of the convention. I don't happen to believe that. Uh, of course, it's, it's useful, but it's neither necessary nor sufficient to stop wars. And that's because wars don't arise because of injustice. Wars happen because some rotten sons of bitches in the United States get control of the Congress and they get control of enough influence, and I'm talking about the military-industrial complex, the weapons makers, 
lifers in the Pentagon, people on Wall Street, people in the oil industry, people in the churches, and you get and people are all around the base communities who want to uh, maintain their jobs, and you get enough of a rolling scrum going, and then there's going to be a war. Okay, so then they're just looking around. Where's a good place to have a war? And then the United States has another war. Okay. So yeah, it's a great idea to create uh, address injustices around the world, but uh, that's not going to keep the United States out of war. Okay, so I guess we have just one final question to wrap it up. Um, how do you think your life would have been different if you hadn't joined the Navy? Navy? Gosh. You know, uh, that's, that's a good question. What it really boils down to is, what would I have done during that winter after I got out of high school? Would I finally snap out of it and go towards some uh, trade or, or, or go to college? Because that's pretty much it, you know? You, you have to, when you're 18, you have to kind of like get your shit together, you know, and make a life. And uh, the question is, you know, there was quite a, a risk at that point in my life that I could have gone towards drugs, drugs and alcoholism. I'm prone to alcoholism. Uh, so I don't know. It's a 50-50 ch uh, choice whether I would have uh, been a failure or would, whether I would have uh, got my shit together. Because I wasn't, I wasn't getting my shit together at that point in time. So if you could go back in time, would you still have joined the Navy? If I could go back in time and, and talk to young Todd at 18, then I would have gone in there with a big uh, list of op opportunities that he didn't even know about. There's all kinds of ways to get hired at an entry level in a lot of different businesses. You know, you know in fact, I did. I worked at an entry level in, uh, in Motorola, for example. And you could uh, work your way up. You know, they're, they're looking for good people at 18. How hard is it to sit here and, and uh, score, you know, chip wafers? You don't have to be a college degree. You don't, you know, I could have, I could have done income taxes just as well as I did after I got out of college for the simple reason that the, all the tax code, they didn't teach you all the tax code in college. Everything I know about tax, I learned on the job in the tax office. I could have started when I was 18. There's no reason I had to wait until I was 24. Yeah. So then you wouldn't still join the Navy? Oh, hell no. Ouch. If I could go back in time and coach myself for three days, I, I, could, have, I could have solved the whole problem. Okay. Is there anything else that you want to tell us about your time in the Navy or what you're doing now? Well, you know, as long as we're being frank, there was a number of experiences I had in the Navy. And one of them was being uh, beat up and sodomized by another sailor with an attack dog. And there's a lot of rape in the military. And the ones that you hear about are women. Three-fourths or more of the women don't even report it because they're ashamed. And what, what's the payoff for reporting it? None of the men ever talk about it. What's the payoff for a man to go to your commanding officer and say, hey, I got beat up and I got butt-fucked by some other guy? That makes me look like uh, someone of questionable sexual orientation, someone who's weak, who can't defend himself, somebody who won't fight to the death to protect their sexuality, you know? So nobody ever reports it. Well, I'll tell you what. There's many thousands of people, men, get raped in the military just like they get raped in prison. Our society is not a good, it's, you know, we've got a lot of Neanderthals in our society. They're out there. Okay. Is there anything else? Let's see now, the Navy. Well, something I'd recommend all kids look into, you know, when the, well, at the time they're looking into going in the Navy, what you really are looking at is <coughs> you're looking at a way of acquiring some benefits and things for yourself. And what you want to do is get a piece of paper and look at the types of money and benefits you're getting, whether it's a GI Bill or some training or whatever it may be. And then get, put that alongside other things that you can do. Like one of the things that, that it happened to me I know this is going to sound perfectly ridiculous. You might not even understand this until you think about it for a while. After I got out of the Navy, I had, uh, I, I had a bad LSD trip. I got some bad acid from my brother, and I was in a mental hospital for a couple of months. Okay, I, uh, as a result of that experience, I applied for disability. And this was a gold mine. 
oh my God, I was getting my books were paid for, I was getting payments to, to, to go to college and to take, re this is vocational rehabilitation. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I was able to go all the way through college without spending any money. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I hate to say this, but it's a great way to make a living to become a fake uh, disabled person. You know, I was not, I did not say to them that I'm disabled. I said, this is a bona fide uh, me medical experience, uh, problem. And now I'm trying to rehabilitate myself. And we filled in all the forms, and by God, I qualified. Okay? But you can't help but realize that, you know, if I really needed money that bad that I was going to go in the Army, I mean, these guys should be recommended for a Darwin Award. Anybody who goes in the Army at this point, after all that we know, uh, why don't you just be a fake, you know, uh, a disabled person? Just be, just be a, instead of, instead of being a fake defender, you know, and actually hurting people and actually making America less safe and participating in a huge fraud, if you're going to do that, why don't you just do a straightforward fraud?